Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. So, uh, so happy to see you guys. I'm excited. Um, welcome to the awesome event. Awesome event. We are, uh, so did they just now turn, I'm confused. So I didn't, it was on, but you guys hadn't turned it on, right? That was how that, okay, that's how that happened. All right. Because I was like, I sure hope they weren't hearing all the stuff that me and Mahim were talking about. Right now. Um, okay, so a um, couple of housekeeping stuff to cover uh, real quick. Uh, one thing is the buffet tomorrow and actually Sunday morning is a full breakfast buffet. It's not a continental breakfast, so it'll include all of the regular breakfast items that you expect uh, at a, a buffet, and a Shoney style or whatever. And then the uh, second thing is if you see anybody, if you have any questions or the people who have the uh, light blue shirts, as you can see here with Jean Catherine and Dave and Jen, um, all of the, these uh, are the conference. Uh, well, it's not a conference. I'm sorry. I, I'll try not to say that. It's, a, it's an awesome event. But uh, that was, I was reminded of that by Dave a couple of times. But this is, um, if you have any questions or, or, or need help with something, these are like your information people too. Um, they're working behind the scenes to make this go smoothly. And um, feel free to approach them for any questions that you have. So um, that was something else that I wanted to share. So now uh, they asked me to uh, open up this event and kind of get the uh, get the tone set and kind of uh, you know no pressure right that's what I mean he said no pressure I just you know I just want to make sure that um, every every that is perfect right exactly that is, no pressure as long as it's perfect so I thought what I would do um, whenever I'm doing a presentation I like to um, do a little something to kind of help get people's uh, minds right for the for the occasion and so I have something here that I want to try here. I see I've got, yes, right here. This, hold on, here we go. I have a deck of cards here. Now, um, for, for you guys in the cheap seats in the back, uh, I'm gonna make sure, I'm gonna do my best to make sure you guys can see it okay, okay? Um, I was given some strict orders to stay within them, but I will, I'll show you the card. Um, and by the way, the first people that show up sit in the back. I don't know what that's about. That may be the expensive seats in the back. But anyway, okay, I have a deck of cards here. These are not trick magic cards. It's a regular deck of cards. Um, if you would, Jacqueline, just, you can check them out. That's good. And, um, well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. You can uh, mix them up for me. Mix them up, uh, shuffle them up. It doesn't really matter as long as you don't get them out of order. Everything's good. <laughs> Oh, it's getting, okay. Now, let's get them back where they were. She messed them up really, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, gonna, the, I'm sorry, the corny jokes, they come with the trick. I have, have to say it. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do for this little uh, effect is I'm gonna take the joker, okay? I'm gonna take the joker and I'm gonna place it um, right here on the top of the deck, just like this. And if you would, just say stop anytime. Stop. Okay, and remember the card, don't say it, okay? Now I'm going to, don't say it, I'm going to break the rules, you know, the principles. You know, I remember one time I heard Linda Pransky say that wisdom will break any rule if it serves the ego, right? So I'm not, I'm going to disregard the ego and I'm going to break a rule and get over here where they can't see me because the light isn't, okay, but you guys saw it, right? Okay. That's your card. Okay. Got it. All right. And Gail, you want to do this too? Okay. Oh, she's like. She was looking over there like she didn't want me to pick her. Uh, say stop anytime. Okay. Now it's not the same card that Jacqueline had. Okay. Good. And we'll show it real quick. Back there. Okay. Breaking the rules again. All right. Here we go. That's your card. Now tell me, um, Gail, do you have a good imagination? Pre you hope so. Pretty good. Hold out your hand for me. And, um, and hold out your hand. Now you remember the card that was on the top in the uh, beginning of this little uh, effect that we're, you guys remember? Joker. Joker, okay, just making sure. So the Joker is on the top, and um, what I want you to do is just think about your card in your mind for a second. You got it? Okay, watch what happens. The card changes. Whoa, was that your card? 
Okay, okay. Now you got a different card. Now you got to think about your card in your mind. Think about it. Now look, it's just one card, right? So let's see. You got it? Okay, watch. The card changes. Was that your card? Okay. Whew. Well, it's only when you, it's only when you think about, there it is, there it is. Now watch what happens. The card changes. Was that your card? Okay. Pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. Now, if I say so myself. Okay. Um, David. David, right? Yeah, it's on your name tag. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> watch what happens when David touches the card. Watch what happens. Y'all aren't going to believe this. Watch what happens. Nothing happens. <laughs> well, well, no, it's because he didn't have a card. He didn't have one. No, it's okay. And I messed with him because of the tag and all that. And, and, uh, but you know what happens is that when we lose our concentration, it changes. But was that the job? Whoa, we, we weren't paying attention. Let me do this. You want to do this again? Can we do this again? Okay, so let's try this again because you guys might think, well, you know, he's, he's talking fast and he's using fancy sleight of hand. So, Jacqueline, if you would say stop anytime. All right, make sure it's not the same card. I'm going to show it around. Break, do what? Okay, that's weird. The same, you can't have the same, you can't have the same card. We'll let you just take one. Uh, anyone you want, doesn't matter. You just pick one out. And, yeah, it doesn't matter. You can take the, yeah, just whichever one you want. Look at it. I'm gonna, what is it? Okay, okay. No, she's messing with me now. She's, we'll put the, uh, was it a nine, right? Club, something like that? Take it out. Say stop anytime. Okay, take that card. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to, okay. Now see, that, that was a trick. I got to confess, that was a trick. See, that's the joker. Um, you know what, let me do this. Jacqueline, come on up the stage. I'll give her a hand. Come on up, come on up. And now I'm, I'm really following the rules because I'm on the stage. So we're going to, um, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's mix them up a little bit. And have you ever played 52 card pickup? <laughs> they have. I'm not, no, I'm not. You, oh, you don't want to play. <laughs> um, but you know what happens is the cards, they get mixed up, face up, face down. OCD starting to kick in. I can tell. <laughs> yeah. So we got cards. We got a mess here. My daughter, when she was about three, got my cards and mixed them all up. And it's such a pain because you got cards facing that way, and you got cards facing that way, and you got. Let's see, some of them are even face to face. So it's a mess, you can see. So we're not gonna use the, um, the nine, okay? Take the king of uh, clubs here, just wave it over the cards, wave it. And you can see what happens is all the, ooh, check it out. All the cards are fixed except for the, was it a king of, what was it? Oh, come on. <laughs> Come on, y'all give her a hand. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> okay. So I wanted to um, not tell you how I did it, by the way. <laughs> whenever, whenever Brock and I do a, a workshop and I do a little magic and, and they, um, and I'll, at the end, it's like, any questions? You know, any, you know, how did you do the trick? That's the only thing they care about. Um, so... But I do want to share with you a, a, a story about magic and, and with, re, related to the principles and to kind of set the, the tone for this weekend. So first off, um, all magic is, and I hate, to, I hate to break it to you, but all it really is, is it's, it's create, what I'm doing is I'm creating a false assumption, okay? I'm, I'm creating a false assumption, and then I'm showing you that it's false, so I'm pulling the rug out from under you. So you, you, she picks the, by the way, I knew she was, little secret, I was making her pick the same card every time, right? So, oh, let's put that card away. And you're like, thank goodness, that nine has given us trouble. He put it over there and it's like, oh, the nine's back again. Well, that, that was your thinking. You thought I put it over here. I never put the nine over here. I, I'm not like super fast and switched them. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a trick of the mind. And a famous magician, Di Vernon, he was actually, his nickname was The Professor, and he said that magic occurs in the mind of the spectator. That it's not the hand is quicker than the eye, it's, it's that the, uh, well, I wouldn't, 
try to rephrase it, but it, it's, it's a trick of the mind. It's not a trick. It's not sleight of hand. Now, how does this relate to what we're up to this weekend? I worked for 17 years in a psychiatric hospital uh, with children, adolescents, and adults. Uh, two days a week, I had a group that I led on the adult unit. So these are adults with severe, who have been labeled severe uh, mental illness. Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, some of them are suicidal. Um, we've got some, some who are detoxing from alcohol or drugs. We've got some who are um, extremely anxious, having panic attacks. And so I would walk on the unit to, to, for group time. And I had group on uh, twice a week at 11.15. And I would, I would come in and I'd say, it's time for group. Group time, everybody group time. And you, you might not be surprised that they're not thrilled about coming to group. Because most of the groups they go to is they sit there and they're given worksheets and they're asked how they feel emotionally, physically, and spiritually, and they fill it out. And, and um, there's a focus on, okay, today we're going to talk about depression or we're going to talk about bipolar disorder. And, and so I come in, and the first thing I do is the same thing I did with you guys, okay? Very same thing. Uh, I walk in. Now, I'm not saying you guys look like this, okay? But you got people who are talking to themselves. You have people who are um, angry and agitated. Some of them are, are sitting there like oh, group time. Like they're so, the last thing they want is to do group. And um, within a minute, mo really within five minutes, but sometimes within a minute, if you were to walk in, you wouldn't be able to tell who had schizophrenia, who had bipolar disorder, who was depressed, who was anxious. Because their mind leaves the world of their head and, it, and, it's, and they're in the moment and their health comes out. And we're talking about the people who are considered exceptions to the rule of innate health. Not that we would say that, but the world would say that, right? When I first started learning about the principles, that was the evidence to me when I saw the people who, are, who struggle the most psychologically, that within minutes, we're not talking about weeks and weeks of going to see magic that they started to feel better. I joked with them. I said, I've had to tell them, guys, y'all need to keep it down. Remember, we're in a psych hospital. <laughs> I had to remind them. You know, I had people that from that space, see, they would say, I had one guy that said, you know, my problem is, is that um, I, I think things that I just can't prove. I, I believe things I can't prove. And I said, well, you know, that's all, that's everybody, isn't it? I mean, we can't, pr I can't prove what I think. And uh, he said, but I have schizophrenia. And I said, well, I guess from that definition, I do too. Because we all think that what we think is, is true uh, a good bit of the time. Just because his happened to be farther over here on the bell curve doesn't make it any, any, any worse. So um, to me, the hope of this message and the universality of this message is that it doesn't matter the labels they have, that a person can see a magic trick and it's not like they said, okay, I gotta, I gotta enjoy this. No, they just naturally enjoyed it. I've had some people not like it. I had one lady file a petition that she didn't want me to do group because she hated it so much, but that's another story for another time. Um, but anyway, the, it was no sweat for me to buy into this because I saw the truth of it. And when I ask the adults, I, I ask them, well, uh, how, how did that, how, how do you guys feel? And they'll tell me that, you know, I mean, you got people that were almost asleep who are on the edge of their seat. And, and it wasn't me. It was not me. It was, it, it was this power that's, that's behind life that, have, that, that kicks into gear, okay? 
And so uh, I'm explaining it to them, like, what's going on? And um, I had one guy say, uh, I've been in hospitals for 20 years, and no one's ever taught me about mental health. <laughs> I've heard that uh, a good bit. The, the, um, the ability for them to be okay is right below the surface. And that, to me, it, it levels the playing field. And when you talk about communities, you're talking about leveling the playing field. That, there, that, that the people that we work with in communities and people in, in um, uh, impoverished communities and, and with, the, with the Child Protective Services, and the, the, it's the same, they're, they're doing the same thing we're doing. And to me, that's the hopeful message. Now, one more thing I want to say, and then I want to introduce our first speaker. Um, for the new people, if you are new, uh, what I found over the years at these conferences, or well, I said conference, I mean, yeah. what I found is that more, um, what was more impactful for me than the, than the breakouts and the speakers were the connections and the relationships that were built and that, that grew from that. So I want to encourage you guys to really be intentional about connecting with each other and getting to know each other and hanging out with each other. And it's that presence and it's that feeling, that's where, that's when the knowledge starts to really take root, okay? So just hang in there with it. If it's confusing, that's not a problem. There are plenty of people that you can talk to and ask about that. And um, so I just wanted to say that to kind of now, we're, now that everybody's quiet, you know, I had them laughing, now they're quiet. I don't know if that's good or bad. Okay, so I want to start with our first speaker. Uh, Mahima Shrestha is from Nepal, and she's an entrepreneur. She um, focuses a lot of her time with change workers, with think tanks, with innovators. Um, she is going to, uh, she's had um, some experiences that are pretty amazing in terms of seeing the resilience in people in, in times of crisis. And she's gonna be our first speaker. Please give a warm welcome to Mahima. Hey. I hope that's good. <laughs> okay, um, can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay, okay. But it's gonna go downhill for a while before it gets better and these guys come back on, so bear with me, okay? <laughs> so um, when I left home, I had a speech that I was gonna give here. Um, I had prepared a speech that sounded perfectly reasonable when I left Nepal a couple of weeks ago now. Um, <laughs> but having spent you know, the past few days here, having spoken to actually several of you here, about your life and your work and what brings you here, pretty much none of that is what I still want to say. So this right here is the new game plan, okay? Uh, hopefully <laughs> it's, it's decent. Um, also, um, if I pause in the middle, don't panic. Um, it's usually just because I'm finding the right words to say. Um, so don't freak out, the show will carry on, okay? Um, okay, so. Basically, what I want to use the next maybe 20 minutes or so doing is to set a bit of context for how I landed up here um, and also to kind of do a little bit of groundwork for some of the stories you're going to hear after me um, and just set a bit of context for that and for the weekend as a whole. Okay. So I um, live in Nepal, I'm an entrepreneur, I um, worked in media, I work in crisis communications, and I've been a question asker pretty much my whole life. I've always wondered about things, about the nature of business, about, um, I've always been curious about what's, um, about the world and our, our role in it. Um, and of all the questions I've asked in my life, there's one question which has like followed me my whole life, which is what the heck is up with people? Like <laughs> people just were not, they didn't make sense to me. Sometimes I didn't make sense to me. I mean, it seemed like intelligent people could do really dumb things. Um, wallflowers, people that I'd never noticed in a crisis could suddenly shine. Um, people just didn't make sense to me at all. 
Um, it was probably um, early to mid-teens. Um, we had a decade of civil war in Nepal. And that was my first introduction to violence, uh, to the threat of violence, to um, just a state of public fear. Um, and that really, I mean, heightened this question of what the heck is up with people, right? Like, how is it that reasonable people, I, and over the years have met many people who are involved on various sides of the conflict, and you see that we are all, in general, kind of reasonable people, and still we're capable of doing incredibly harmful, hurtful things to each other, right? So this question of what is the deal with that? Um, and then over the years had an opportunity to work in many areas where that question just got bigger, right? So there was um, a project related to AIDS, there was child trafficking, there's of course education, innovation, business. In all of these areas, people to me were just this wild card in the system. It seemed like they sh there was a logical way that people should turn out, but they really didn't. Um, like in crisis response, I would train people and they would, I mean, they can repeat the drills in their sleep and everything, right? But still, you chuck them in the middle of a crisis, a television camera and a mic comes out here and people say the dumbest things. It's, I mean, it just seemed like, the, I, I was tracking all these variables, right? Of like hours of training, of performance in training, of personality types, still no answers to why the hell people were so strange. They were so hard to understand, right? And me included, I mean, sometimes I do stuff that the next morning I'm like, what? <laughs> what is the deal with that, right? So it, it, people were just this wild card that just never, like it never fit. I kept thinking, oh, at some point I'll bump up against something and this whole thing would make sense, but no, it just never did. Um, and at some point, I started, I mean, it, it bugged me enough that I started to talk to people about that. I started to ask people who were just, I guess, broadly speaking, change makers, right? So it could be um, coaches, mentors, teachers, parents, just people who people came to them a certain way, and they were responsible for some kind of change, so when people left them, they were another way, right? So I just started talking to people and asking people, just like, what's the deal with that? What do you think about that? And it was not like this formal process of training so much as just asking people, like, what do you think is the deal with people? Like, what have you seen about change and about the potential within people? What, what have you seen? And eventually I met somebody who said to me, well, people make sense to me um, and I can teach you what I know and you can see for yourself, right? Um, he also said to me that I, had completely spent the last, I don't know, nine years looking in just the opposite direction to where I was gonna find any answers, right? So essentially what he said was, I have been tracking variables within people, right? Individual differences in culture, in gender, in personality, in individual history. I've been tracking all these variables in people and thinking that if I track enough of these variables over a long enough period of time, it will be predictive that I will be able to tell that these kind of people will do well in these kind of settings. These other people, when you have something important, never pick them, right? Like I expected that at some point with enough data, people would make sense to me, right? But they really just didn't. Um, there was always inconsistencies. There was always holes in that theory. Um, and finally, somebody pointed out to me that the holes in the theory was because I'm looking at variables. I'm not gonna find universal constants in the variables. Right. It should have been obvious, but it really wasn't. I mean, I was looking for a really long time. Um, and then eventually somebody pointed me in the direction of constants. And essentially he said, well, there are constants in people that are true regardless of culture, gender, age, background, whatever. That there are some things that are true for all of us in here, right? And true of all people at all times. And that if I looked there, I would find help and answers there about all the questions I had about people. And that people would make more sense to me and I would make more sense to me. Um, and so um, it piqued my interest, but I, I mean, taking people's word for it has never been my strength. I've just, I, it's not something I'm able to do easily. Uh, so I just thought, oh, good for him, he's figured that out. Um, and it was just something that 
I was, I was curious about that. I was curious how he came to the conclusions he came to. But it wasn't something that I, that hit me like, oh my god, yeah, people make sense now. No, it, it didn't. I just thought it, it was, he had a theory about that. Um, like, I, I had a theory about people. So I just thought it was one of those things where he had a perspective, right? Um, and eventually, over a couple of conversations, his claims got bolder. Um, not just that they're universal, but he's like, no, I'm going to tell you exactly what's common in all people, right? Um, and one of the things he said was that, well, we are all thinkers. All of us here, we are all thinking beings, which I couldn't disagree with. I agreed that we're all thinkers. But here's what he said, that it caught my attention, but it wasn't like I heard it. I was like, yeah, he's totally right. Um, but this is what he said. He said, there's me over here, and I think that there's life over here, right? There's bills and exams and kids who don't behave and deadlines that are coming up and a bank statement that's not growing. There's all this stuff, right? And there's me over here. Now, this stuff, I bump into that, right? I get a bill on my desk. I see a deadline that's coming up. I tell somebody to do something and they don't bother. Um, and when I bump up against that, I feel sad or angry or upset or mad or happy or surprised, right? So he said, it, I think that I see this stuff out here, and I think when I bump up against that, I feel this stuff. And what he was saying was that there's an invisible layer right over here that I have just not seen, that there's a, there's a variable over here that I have completely not taken into account that the variable was not that stuff of what's happening in my life and what my history is, right? But there's a filter over here which he called thought. Now, I might call that headspace or I might call that perception, right? So that the stuff over there bumps up against this filter that I've got going over here. And I start to think about those things. I see the bills and I have certain types of thinking I do when I normally see bills, right? And what I feel is the result of this thinking over here, right? So he was saying, I have no clue about the bills and the exams and the kids. All I have a clue about is what I think about them, right? So this was his, this was his theory that all that I knew as life and all of my opinions and beliefs were this filter, that I had no clue about the world out there. I have no way of directly experiencing the world out there that I think stuff about the world out there, and I feel stuff that is a response to the stuff I'm thinking. It looks to me like what I feel is a response to life out there, but no, right? So that's what he said. And I said, well, good for him. He's figured it all out. Um, and then just, I was curious about it, but again, didn't do anything. I, it was like simmering away at the back of my mind. Um, and then, April 2015 came along, and in Nepal we had a big earthquake. And um, th this is the thing. Now, in Nepal, we have been talking about earthquakes for I don't know how many decades, and nobody told me that when you have a major earthquake, the ground basically doesn't stop shaking for a couple of weeks after. It's like, how come nobody told me that piece of detail? Because it freaked me out. <laughs> it's like, I mean, there's this big shake, and then it's over. You're like, okay, okay. I can, I can deal with this, but no, it just goes on. Nobody told me that. So this is, and then of course, every, every few minutes, there would be this big aftershock, you all run out, there's all this panic. So it was one of those times, right? So we all run out and I'm standing on the porch watching my house go like that, right? And just gripped with all of this terror of like what I'm seeing and what could happen. And at the same time, I get kind of, I'm aware of two things happening in my head, right? On one hand, just shit scared. Um, and on the other hand, just a, a question to myself really of, is it that I'm really afraid of the shaking that's going on for a couple of seconds? Or am I afraid because I've got a head full of thinking about what this means, about what could happen, what if the house comes down, what if things get worse in Nepal. My head is full of all this stuff. And I start to think, is it that I'm afraid because stuff is shaking a bit, or am I afraid of all this stuff that I have in my head, right? And it's taken me longer to explain it than it was that it actually happened. It was a moment, it was a split second of thinking, 
really, is it the shaking that I'm afraid of? Because I got a big ass story in my head right now. That's really scary. And it looks to me now like I'm freaking myself out, right? So in that moment, there was just a, and this is, this is something I want to highlight here, that it can seem like we're sharing something that's, uh, that's something you can intellectually understand. Right? That, I mean, there's thought and there's life and you, you feel the r results of your own thinking. But the truth is, this is intensely practical. It doesn't seem like it would be practical because there isn't anything you can go home and apply. Right? But to see things differently has an inescapable impact on your life. You show up differently in the world. Right? So that's what I discovered. So the reason I wanted to share that story is I was recently speaking to a friend of mine. She's an anthropologist, right? And she has done a whole lot of research on gifts and gift giving. And from like isolated tribal cultures all the way to the digital economy, right? And one of the things she said that struck me was that a gift is not a thing given in order to be possessed. It is a thing given in a spirit of generosity that you may then go on and give to others, right? So that's really the spirit in which I want to share these things with you here today, hoping that what you get from this weekend, you will go back and you will share that with the families and the communities and the organizations that you go home to when this weekend is over. Right? So one of the gifts I received from coming across the principles was just help in a moment of need. Right? That there, there was that there was help built into my head like built into the design of a human had just never occurred to me. I always thought that help was to be worked for. I mean, if you, if you had trained or you had thought beforehand or you had prepared, then you would have help in a moment of need because you had done all the legwork for it, right? But the, the potential that insight or new ideas or fresh perspective on things is just built into the human mind had just it had just genuinely never occurred to me. Um, so that's one of the gifts I hope you'll find this weekend, right? Help in moments of need, to realize that you have built into you this profoundly intelligent, helpful system, that as you learn something about the internal processing in your own life, you will find help in your life where you need it, not by working for it, um, but because it's there. It's there when we are not blind to it, right? So this is the first, this is the first gift that I wanted to share. Um, and then, of course, after the earthquake, you know, life goes on. And so I got back to work. Um, I've always been interested in the state of the world, in big questions about the world, in change at large scales. Um, and this was, a, this was the second gift that I didn't, I wasn't expecting it. It wasn't something I'd expected to find, which is I realized that in working with large scale issues that you can get kind of bummed out. Like, I mean, stuff takes really long to change. I, in my head, it shouldn't. I mean, it's like, well, come on. I mean, don't you see it? It shouldn't. And it, no, but it, it, no, it doesn't work like that, right? So it, it first of all, it took me a while to figure out that it's not going to work like that. Um, and secondly, I thought that when, when I realized it's not going to work like that, I'm going to be really bummed out for a while because I really want stuff to change, right? But it, it changes at its own pace. It changes literally one person at a time. <laughs> There is no mass production version of the kind of change I want to see in the world, right? Um, so, but what happened when I realized that was that I realized I had received the second gift from coming across the principles, which was just a gift of hopefulness about the world and about other people and about our part in the world, right? So I do a lot of work with think tanks, with innovators, with entrepreneurs, with change makers of various kinds. Um, and there are some groups that we meet to discuss policy on issues we really care about. And because there's a group of 20 somewhat intelligent, very well-informed people who really care about an issue, we are really opinionated about those issues. Um, and we say that we are here to kind of talk and listen, but we're really not. We just want people to do what we want them to do. We just want it all to go our way. 
Okay, and, and I mean, that's me 100%. 100%, like there is some issues where I'm just blind to anybody else's point of view. I'm like, oh, surely anybody who's intelligent can see this is the way to go, right? But here's what happens. Now this particular group, we had been meeting for 13 weeks, two hours a week, okay? To make a couple of decisions on some policies. 13 weeks, two hours a, uh, two hours a week, perfectly intelligent human beings sat around a table having conversations till our mouths are dry Zero solutions, zero. Like literally, we had not agreed on one thing in 13 weeks, right? And in my head, all this time, I'm thinking, yeah, that's because, I mean, they're so goddamn stubborn, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're refusing to, they don't listen to each other. They, I mean, I'm, I, they, they, I've been trying to say this for like, I don't know, all these weeks, they, they, nobody's listening. We keep arguing with each other. In my head, the problem is all them. It's like, I mean, come on, if only they were different, or if I had different people in the room, or if other people were only willing to listen, it would all work out, right? And so, we're, so what happened during those 13 weeks is, of course, as decisions got fewer and fewer, it got more and more heated, right? Because the pressure was on to make some choices. Um, so there would be like paper throwing and fist banging and all this yelling, but like no, no decisions. So now one fine day, we are across the table, me and this guy, we're across the table having an argument about something. And it starts to get more and more heated. He says something, I say something, he says something, I say something. Then he says something and I have in my head a rather scathing response <laughs> to what he has just said, right? So I begin the sentence and then it hits me like a ton of bricks that I have sat in front of that guy for 13 weeks and I, my head has been so full of all the things I think about him that I have not heard him, like at all, at all. All I've been hearing every time the guy speaks up is all the stuff I think about him, none of it helpful, right? Um, and all this while, I'm thinking the problem is that guy. Right? Now you would think that I mean this many years in, like I would get the idea, but I really haven't. Um, I mean really, really convinced for all these weeks that the problem was that guy. Now I'm mid-sentence and I've suddenly realized that there's this guy that I have, that has been trying to say something to me clearly that he cares about a lot that I have just completely not seen. I mean it was, he might as well have been invisible because every time he spoke, I could hear the stuff I had in my head about him, right? And then I look around the room and I realize that is true of every other person in the room. I have not heard any of them, any of them. I came in with an idea of like, oh, that's that guy, that's that guy, that guy's this kind of guy, this is that kind of person, oh, she's that girl. I came in with all of these opinions and I hadn't changed a single one of them. I was very comfortable with all the things I had pre-decided about them, right? So this is the other thing that you will find, yes, help and hope, but also it's really inconvenient. Um, because you're going to have times that you just want to look impressive and professional and it's not going to happen, <laughs> right? So this is one of those moments that I have to stop mid-sentence and have this really blank <laughs> look going for a while because I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to that. All I know is that I was doing something profoundly unhelpful and I should now do something different, but I have no idea what that is and I have no idea how I should now say that I've basically not listen to you guys for all these weeks. I know I've been saying you haven't been listening, but neither have I, right? So then finally, I suck it up and I say, okay, I take it all back. I'm sorry, um, but I've just realized that we have spent all this time talking. And when I look around the room, I see a bunch of people who really, really give a shit, right? I might disagree with you on how specifically we should get the result we want, but you and I want the same thing. But we have been so adversarial for so many weeks that we have forgotten to do that first thing, which is what I now want to know. How come you got here? How have you come to the conclusions you have come to? Why do you give a shit about this issue so much? What, what brings you here? Why do you care about this? You've clearly worked in it for a long time. What conclusions have you come to? Why? Right? Like, I had been hearing their conclusions and saying yes, no, possible, maybe partially right. Uh, but I mean, I, I had not really listened to them or tried to understand them. So then I said, like, can we back up all those weeks back and do what I hope we sh I should have done in the first meeting and we'll do subsequently, which is like, 
just check in with you guys. Can can we go around the table and just say, so and so, this is the background that I came from. These these are the turning points that led to the realizations and decisions that I think we should make. Here's what I've learned, and just like listen to that, right? And now this is the thing that gives me hope. In my head, that if you were so adversarial for so many weeks and then you brought this up, there would be some eye rolling going on. There would be some people who are like, yeah, I knew you weren't listening. Um, that's, what, that's what I would expect, right? But instead what happens is one guy in the corner over there says, yeah, actually I'd like to know that too. And a lady on this side says, well, I'll, I'll begin. And just like that, just like that, in a couple of moments, it was as though we were completely different people sitting around that table, right? Moments. No big intervention, no facilitation, no nothing, just one person seeing that they had played an unhelpful part in something they didn't like around them and being willing to open themselves to other people to share what they had seen and inviting other people to share what they're seeing Right? It takes moments to create change. Moments, not, not years, not anything. It takes moments for a whole group of people um, to completely, I mean, it was as though we had been friends. I mean, I was suddenly curious about them. I liked them. I admired so many of them. I had not even seen that for all these weeks. I mean, admiration was far from what was on my mind all of those weeks. Right? So this is, this is the other gift that I hope you will take with you this weekend, which is just a sense of hopefulness about the world. Right? I think so many times we come to events like this either because we are hopeful and we want to share that and be with other people who are sharing that, or we've kind of run out of it for a while. And you get a bit jaded and a bit upset with the way things are going. And we come to places like this to hopefully renew some of that. Right? and go back a little bit renewed, a little bit fresher, a little bit more hopeful. So this is the second thing that I hope you will get from this weekend, and I hope you'll take it with you. Right? Because when we look at the world out there, like people could use some of that hope, I think. Um, and I hope you guys will play a big part in going back and sharing that with other people. Okay? That's all I'm gonna say. Welcome to the awesome event. See ya. Okay, okay. Try a little experiment real quick. Um, you guys are gonna help me with this. I want, can you guys follow directions? See if you guys can do this. Put your hands out, uh, thumbs down, with the back of your hands facing each other like so, okay? Take your right hand and put it over your left hand so that your thumbs are down. Gra if you can, grab your hands like that. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, there you go. Now here's what I want you to do is I want you to go like this. See? Straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You didn't do it? Did you? All right. You guys got a lot of work to do. Okay. So um, for our, uh, our next um, talk is going to be a conversation. Um, we've got uh, Dejan White here, who is the founder of Rebels for Peace, which is a youth-led uh, organization from south of Southside Ch Chicago, who's um, their mission really is to, is to uh, really not just decrease, but get rid of the violence. And, um, and I just think it's awesome to have young leaders. Um, and they, I mean, let's just, that, that alone is great. great. Yeah. And so um, he's going to uh, come up, and Jean Catherine Gray, who is the founder of Divine Play, and, and really the horsepower behind this whole event, you know, and she's distracted at the moment. That's fine. <laughs> she's not hearing what I'm saying about her. Um, anyway, and so she's going to come up, and they're going to have a conversation. And so um, welcome uh, Jean Catherine Gray and Dejan White. Testing, testing. Thank you for having us here. We're just, yeah. Um, we're just thrilled to be here, so now we're just going to completely ignore you, okay? Hi, Dijon. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Okay, so tell me how your flight was. My uh, flight was terrifying. <laughs> um, it was my first time flying, so 
I'm, I'm scared of heights too, and I was afraid of, <laughs> and I was afraid of playing. So like that was just something new to me. And like when it was going up, I closed my eyes shut and was like that, tight to get the popping up out my head. And then when I looked down, I saw like a lot of buildings, and I didn't want to see it, so I turned back that way. And then my uh, teacher Miss Short, she was re recording everything, like it was stressing me out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but when it got like, 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 like even out, I uh, pictured the uh, clouds like the North Pole. Um, the clouds was the uh, snow and the little blue parts was the little pools or the puddles of water mm -hmm. so I can feel more closer to the ground. <laughs> um, and when we was going down, my ears was popping. I tried to chew some grapes to uh, stop the popping about my ear. It worked a little bit, but not like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, I got out the plane. I uh, took a picture with the uh, pilot, and that thing went smooth because I was on the ground again. So. Ah, uh, that's so good. Thank you. <laughs> you know, one of the things that um, people want to know about you, okay, when they see a young man from South Chicago who created a piece for Rebels Gang. People wonder, like, well, what's up with that kid? You know, what's his deal? Where did he come from? What's his story? And I wonder if you would tell us, you know, a little bit about your background, about you. Okay, um, I'm 18 years old. I'm a, a junior in high school. Go to Respective Cayman on 81st in May. Um, I got, well, I had both of my parents in my life, but my daddy, he went to jail. Uh, so for like two years now, mm -hmm. he got us since uh, seven years. But my mama, she's still in my life. She, my superwoman. Yeah. Uh, she do everything that she can for me. She bought me clothes, the shoes, everything I, I got on. Mm -hmm. um, she bought me a tie, but I ain't put it on. I had to tie the tie on. I tie the tie, so I ain't put it on. <laughs> um, I got my grandma. My grandma, she real helpful. She real supportive. She she loving the can. She cook for me every time I need something cook. I like pancakes a lot, so she make pancakes. Mm. Um, uh, I I'm a fam fa family of eight, and I'm the sixth child. Um, I lost two brothers to a, a car accident, and my stepmom at the same time. Mm. Um, I still got my oldest brother. My oldest brother, he up in jail. My second oldest brother up in jail too. And it's just me, my sister. Her uh, son and her daughter. Well, she pregnant now with a, with a with a son. And mm -hmm. um, my other sister and my two little brothers. Well, my uh, two little brothers they look up to me because I play ball, so they want to be mm -hmm. just like me. So they hoop and and uh, want to play football too. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, sister Siobhan, she just went to uh, college. Um, I come from a background with parents that's in the game. Mm. My daddy was a different game. My mama was a, was a, was a different game. And like my uh, mama brothers and my daddy, you was always getting to it, shoot at each other, fight, all that good stuff. Mm. But when my mama and my daddy found each other and they fell in love, my uh, daddy and my uncles put, put their differences aside so my mama and my daddy can be together. So now we like one big happy family. So, mm, yeah. so like, they put their pride aside, all the all the little gang banging stuff aside to come together as one big happy family so they can be together. So they found something better than arguing and fighting with each other. So they found love. So now they we like this now. Right? Yeah. So they now they tight. Um I that's have about one, it. I have one question. When you said you play ball, do you mean basketball or football or both? Um uh, my freshman year I played football. I ain't played again because I don't like contact. <laughs> um, but I I played basketball since sixth grade though no since fourth grade so uh, I've been playing ever since then. Okay, well, that happens to be my one of my favorite sports. Basketball. Yeah, okay, as a basketball coach for girls, love it. So good choice. Um, you know, one of the questions that you know people have when they hear a story like yours is why didn't you follow the path of I mean. What happened that you're not in jail tonight, that you're sitting here with us, and that you've started this piece for Rebels? Um, rebels for yeah, Peace, rebels thank for you. Peace. Um, my will, basically, throughout my whole life, I've been put as like, 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 I've been put up on a high stool to take the family out, 
like to take all of us on about the hood because like all my brothers went, went down the same path as my daddy so all them game bangs were there in jail mm -hmm. but they well my daddy and my mama they saw potential in me and my other brother with that dad up in the car crash because he played football and wrestling so they put the high stool up on me and him so we, they can so we can take them about the hood mm -hmm. so so like that motivated me more because i could like because like one time when like i was a little kid we ain't had nothing to eat and then we lived on uh 81st and same man then my uh, daddy had to scramble up some little money. He bought some uh, ground beef and some crackers. Made some little meatballs and some crackers. So we mm -hmm. ate that. And, like ever since then, like I ain't want to see us hurt no more. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't want to see us scrambling for no food or see see my mama crying about paying the next bill or nothing like that. So that motivated me more. And then when my uh, brother's dad, that motivated me even more to try to take us about like like so we don't gotta live like how we was living mm -hmm. and then when my daddy went to jail that motivated me even more because like he was the main um a provider for us he did everything that he could to make sure we had the latest shoes the games the beds everything so when he left that motivated me even more to be something else other mm -hmm. than what everybody else it, like 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 what like what the uh chicago people expect young teens to be mm -hmm. game banging on the street working at dead end jobs um mm -hmm. Like and then another thing that motivated me was all my homies. Like all my homies, they they think I'm the key to take them out, to take them out the hood too. Cause like mm -hmm. all them game banging, but I feel like that. Well, I hold myself to a to, to like a higher standard too. But I also hold them to the same thing that, that they hold me to. Mm -hmm. Like since I'm doing it, y'all can do it too. Mm -hmm. Like I ain't just the only one. So I expect them to go to college, get them a good college a degree, good job, raise their kids, live happy life. Mm -hmm. But that's all that's all the thing that motivated me to keep on going, doing what I'm doing. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, so here's a question, because I know that this year has been transformative for you in some way. And I wonder what was life like for you at this time last year? Well, okay, that's real easy. <laughs> this time last year, uh, well in October we got well, me and my homies got into a uh, altercation with this boy, which ended up the boy getting his jaw broke, and another kid getting had to be picked up by the ambulances. And um, we got into a lot of altercations last year. Well, time this year, we got into a lot of altercations, a lot of fist fights, a lot of mm -hmm. criminal stuff. Um, we like we had to like when we was coming from uh, school, we had to like watch our back because. Cause like we had like ops, the ops like the opposition, the people that's from different areas from us. Mm -hmm. So we had like people like that that like to ride up and start shooting or hop out the car and try to fight us. So like walking back and forth to school, that was a hazard right there. Yeah. Going to going to the corner store a hazard. So we had to we had to watch our surroundings. It was like every day, I could have lost my life or got beat to death mm -hmm. or went to jail. So like my life last year, well, what time this year was just going day by day, just, just risking it, mm -hmm. just to be going to school or going to the corner store. Quite a story, isn't it? I mean, how did you end up? So this question is a leading question um, because Dijon went in May to the Peace Summit in Chicago. And Dijon, how did you end up at the Peace Summit? Mm, okay. Um, I'll, when I was in school, uh, it's, we had um, um, electives, and I didn't like my elective because it was too much work in there. Um, so, <laughs> so I was talking to my friend named Mary, and he was telling me that the peace team, the peace, the peace team is this uh, class that Miss Schwartz was the teacher at. Mm -hmm. um, they, he said that they ain't do no work at all. So, <laughs> so, so like. <laughs> So I ain't so I ain't really care about the peace stuff. I just want they won't do no work. So I so I signed up for the class. Then when I went to the class, I saw a lot of people that I was like cool with, and that's so I'm like, oh, it should be a good class. We're gonna be chilly, we're gonna be kicking our feet up, just chilling. Mm -hmm. So then we get up in the well, I get up in the um, we start uh, talking about stuff like peace stuff. Then we had uh, it's this thing at our school. It's this room called the um, the uh, peace room. 
and they decorating the peace room. They doing some real cool stuff like doing um um, um mediations, help helping out the deans and doing like peace walk, planning for the peace walk and stuff like that in uh Chicago. That was some cool stuff then. Uh it was we we one day uh we had this thing called the peace circle and they and well Miss Shorts taught me about the bowl of light, which is like the bowl is like your mind and the light is all the positive things that's going on in your head. And then they use staples for the negative things. So if you keep on filling your bowl with staples, mm -hmm. which is the negative thoughts, you're not gonna see the light no more, but it's gonna always be there. And then once they uh started um subtracting the uh staples. I started to see the light. So basically, your light is always there. You just got to get the negative thoughts out, and you're going to find your positive thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then we went up on a, a field trip to the uh, peace summit. I didn't care about the peace. I just wanted to go out the field trip because I was getting out of school. <laughs> so we went to the peace summit. Um, they had some good things there. And when uh, Mara started talking about the superpower, um, I wasn't really interested in it because when I thought about the soup pal, I was thinking like she was talking about the Marvel characters like Thor and Hulk and them. That's what I thought she was talking about. And when she was talking about the man, I was like, man, I ain't really signing up for that cup of tea. So, but, but then we uh, branched out to different rooms, uh, me and my friend Zylon, that's like my brother, my homie. So we uh, picked the uh, superpower room. We all went down and then, uh, we we see Mara, they and she keep talking about the mind. She keep talking about the uh, way of life, like like the circle of uh, violence. It don't gotta keep on going. Like retaliation, it can stop. But as I grew up, I thought that circle of violence, cause it could never stop. I always had to get my leg back. I, had, I always had to get him before they got me. Mm -hmm. That's what I always thought. And when she said that, like something like stuck to me, like clicked in me, like my bowl of light came on. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. I uh, thought that since since like I got a lot of rep because who my family is, I think from different gangs, so I know a, a lot of people. So um, I said that I can get some of the big homies to talk to the little homies and tell the little homies like to chill out. We don't gotta go shoot them. We don't gotta go kill them. We don't gotta make nobody else feel hurt because somebody puts a pain up on us. Like we can deal that by ourselves. And then uh, Miss Shorts, she was like, is you going to be the one to do it? So I paused for a minute because, like, I didn't really know what to say. I said, yeah, though, because, like, why not? Why can't it be me? And then um, ever since then, i just been rolling with it. Yeah. Nice. Mm. Mm. Um, why can't it be me? Right, that's so significant. I just want you to, you know, really take that in for all of us, right? Why not? Um, so, Dijon, what's happened since? Um, well, me, well, how the Rebels started, me and my friend Marion, we uh, came up with a name called the Rebels for uh, Peace. And then after that, I did just kept blowing and blowing and blowing. And then we was irritating Mara and much shorts because we kept on trying to have meetings and talks to talk about different things that we can do. Like, we was kept irritating them. I say kept irritating them. <laughs> I We missed lunch one day just to go and talk to them, just to tell them more stuff about it. Um, we uh we've been doing podcasts. Um, we we've been doing like Rebels for a uh, Peace um episode there up on iTunes. I believe it's just one up there right now, but it's a lot more. Mm -hmm. Um, you go up on iTunes, you can just type in One Solution Rebels and you can see it. Um, we got an internship going up at my uh, school. Uh, all juniors got an internship, and we got twelve. Uh, people from my uh, school uh, doing an internship with Ms. Shorts and uh, One Solution. Mm -hmm. um, we started an uh, after-school program. It's not just for my school, but it's at my school. It's from it's like different people can uh, come there and come to after-school program. Mm -hmm. mm, it's been good. A lot of people say it's helpful. It like it gets stuff off their chest. Like cause like a lot of people they don't they don't feel good like to talk about their uh, problems to other people. And then when like when people was there talking. Uh, like all about their problems, people saw that all the he up in the same situation as me, so I can be cool with him. We can talk talk about all our problems. And then um, we got a Rebels Peace Jam coming up uh, December 9th. It's at Refuge Live. It's in Chicago, from one to four Chicago time. Mm -hmm. 
So um, if you are in the area <laughs> or passing through, um, yeah. What else we've been doing? That's a lot already. Yeah. So I just want to remind you that was just since May. Yeah. 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 It's not a very long time. So it speaks to what Mahima really brought up, right? That the moments of change right. it can happen so quickly. Um, so I, I guess my my last official question that I'm allowed to ask you is what motivates you to keep going with the rebels? You know, basically, I just want to see smiles up on the faces of the people that I love and I care about. Well, uh, for, for starters, my homies, everybody that I grew up with, I don't want them to think that like they got to work at dead end jobs or they got to be up on the corner selling wheels or something like that to feed their kids or to make ends meet. I want them, I want like to get them back some hope and faith that they can be more than what they think they can do. Mm. And for my family, I just want, I just want all my family to be proud of me. I want them to like, like to, like to see like this is a different world out here. Like we don't gotta stay at this little low level. We can become more than what we is right now. Mm -hmm. Like that's all that's motivating me. I just wanna see everybody that I love and I care about smile and live a good life without looking over their back, seeing somebody gonna shoot them or that can't walk to the store cause we scared that a group of boys gonna try to jump us or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, one thing I would love to do is have your teacher stand up. Can you introduce her? Wonderful Miss Shorts. <laughs> Thank you. Because you know the bottom line and something that Dijon has really shared tonight is that nobody does it alone, right? So none of us can accomplish anything by ourselves. And so there's this incredible capacity that you've discovered, which you're then going out into your community and sharing with others. And then those people come and they become part of your lifting up. And I, I wanna thank you for sharing your story tonight. Um, I don't know how many people grew up in an area where you had friends or were part of a gang. Just raise your hand. So I'm raising my hand, okay. So we have three people. So you know, you've shared something that most people don't have a insight into, don't, don't see that world that doesn't exist for them. Mostly because we don't know, right? We're not living there, we're not seeing that. And it's important that people hear those stories and that there is hope. Is there anything else you wanna share with everybody before we finish? Um, all y'all look wonderful. Thank y'all for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was awesome. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I mean, we, that's what we, we wanted it to be awesome, and it was, so that was great. <laughs> great. You know, you can really tell when, when, when someone, I like to say it's like they got bit. You know, when you get bit by this understanding, you know, that it's just like you can't, you can't help but want to share it and spread it and do whatever you can. And so um, just getting that, having that defining moment of you getting it, and then it's like, you know, the rest is, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, um, and I can't remember how Sid, w Sid would say, it, I don't know exactly how he worded it, but something to the effect of it's a done deal. So um, it's in motion now, so that's awesome. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Jacqueline Hollows, and she um, has um, actually a lot of IT background, but, but has recently been working more with inmates. And um, she's uh, the founder of a program called Beyond Recovery. All right there, okay. And um, has also been a part of some groundbreaking research. So please give a warm welcome to Jacqueline Hollows. You know how you felt when Dejan was telling his story 
and you were stirred and you felt compassionate and warm towards him. And, and, and how it was spoken at the beginning, that that's the teacher. So anybody that you see on this stage is really pointing to those feelings are the teacher. So what you feel inside, what stirs within you, is what you're taking away with you, regardless to what we all say. I was very moved by that story. And so it occurs to me to tell you um, why I'm here and introduce myself fully to you. Um, because I feel that the, the story that I bring um, is coming from that feeling. And <laughs> I got all excited then. <laughs> um, is coming from that feeling and isn't about me. <coughs> It's about what I represent. So, um, yes, I was from an IT background and uh, not from mental health background or addiction background or anything like that, although I've had um, plenty of things in my past that I could tell you about in my family and um, even uh, with my own son. And... Um, I came to a point seven years ago where um, I had a change of career and um, I decided to become a life coach. And I didn't really know what a life coach was, but it sounded cool. And I was really bored with being in IT. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, I, at that time was when I was introduced to the three principles, which is what we're talking about here and some of the stuff that we're referring to. And um, I'm one of those people that hated the principles, so sorry, sorry, got to admit that. Is there anyone else in here? That, yeah, great, great. <laughs> so I was just like, you can keep that bunch of rubbish. Probably didn't use the stronger words than that. Um, and I'll, I'll look over here. So I learned all these coaching techniques and I learned about all this other stuff, but nothing, nothing really sort of got me, but I like people. And I like to think that we all have the solutions inside us. And I like to think that we could all uh, uncover those solutions. But I thought the, the principles were a bunch of woo-woo, basically, and, um, or maybe even a cult. And um, I was getting on with my life, and um, my life was in a bit of a bit of a pickle, actually. Um, I'd um, got myself into a corner. I was financially having a lot of difficulties. Um, in fact, I lost everything. I lost my home. I lost my car. I'd lost my job already. Um, I'd. Um, you pretty much start, had to start all over again. And I was interested in that I was unfazed by this stuff that was going on in my life. I was like, oh, I don't seem as sort of stressed out as I thought I might be um, when these types of things are happening. And um, along my journey, I... Um, I was looking for business, I was working with executives, and a lot of them came to me and, and they they were all problems with alcohol or problems with um, having to go to the bathroom and, and snort coke or uh, crying in the bathroom because they were so anxious and stressed out. And so I was meeting all these people with all these problems, but they had these sort of lives that looked really good. And um, on my journey, I, um, I, I met someone who uh, was completely different from everybody else that I'd met in that he was so inspiring. And um, I, I, I just, my world was rocked when I met him. I, he was just so inspiring. I thought he was amazing. 
um, and I wanted to spend a lot of time with him. And he'd had a lifetime of addiction, prison. Um, he called himself um, a self-confessed scumbag. And um, he was three years in recovery uh, from a uh, heroin addiction. And um, I, I was inspired by him. He was, he was starting a company, a non-profit company. He was helping other people. Um, he used to have people in his home that he would self-detox uh, them at home. Um, he'd go into prisons and teach people how to make films and uh, write scripts and take photos. And um, I was just inspired by him and I wanted to be around him. So I volunteered for his company and I started helping him out. And through him, I met all these other people who um, in, in all sorts of different states of addiction and not addiction and just released from prison and, you know, um, two years released from prison and so on. And um, it was a funny thing because I naturally started to talk to them about the inside out nature of life, about how we create our own reality, about how um, everybody is, is perfect and that the, the, everybody has solutions. And, they liked this conversation. They thought it was different and they were sort of being impacted, you know, they started to, to feel better. But I thought they were amazing. Um, every single person that I met was amazing. They were, they were resilient, they were determined, they were persistent, but they didn't think they were amazing. And I noticed that, um, what is that then about? Why didn't they think they were amazing? But I could see they actually were amazing. And, and that's all it was for me, is that I wanted people to know that they were amazing. So I kept talking to them. And um, one day, um, I was volunteering for this guy who was making films. And um, it was a beautiful, um, September day in the UK, the sun was shining and we were doing a recovery walk so people go on a walk and they celebrate recover recovery from mental health issues and from addiction issues and um, I walked into this park and in this park there were all these people in all sorts of states and, and so on and Something happened to me. I was suddenly drenched in a feeling of love. I, look, I looked at all these people and I loved them. And I, I had the thought in that moment, I knew in that moment I have to work with them. I don't care how or what it means or how I'll make it happen or how will I get paid? How will I pay my bills? I don't care about any of those things. I love those people and I want to work with them. And that's all I know. And um, I, I started talking to somebody that day and it was almost like I was speaking in tongues. I was just talking about how pe people are amazing and resilient and talking about all this inside out nature of life and I didn't even know what I was saying. But he heard me and he said, you need to come and tell my, my guys this. And um, over the next 18 months, that's what I did. I just went and talked to groups and talked to people. And I'd never run a group before. I'd never sat in a room before with, with somebody who had got 20 years of, of alcohol abuse behind them and anger issues and issues from childhood about abuse and so on. I'd, I'd never done that before, but I kept following that and, um, and, and kept on that journey. Um, you may have gathered when I said that I hated the three principles when I first came across them, I'm a, I'm a bit of a slow learner. 
Um, and I didn't know until two years later that that moment in the park was an insight. I, I didn't even know what an insight was. <laughs> um, and I'm telling you this because like, it's a word. It doesn't really mean anything. That feeling inside you when you just feel like you, you just want to do something, even if it's like, I just feel like I want to go and have a nap. You know, that can be an insight because it's, it's your body telling you you're tired. So we put words on things and, and they sound like they should be something, but they're, they're really just natural. They're occurring to us all the time. So um, I was really fortunate because I, I knew that I wanted to work with people with addictions and I, I knew that I was having impact, but I had no idea how come. <laughs> and. Um, I just kept doing that, and eventually I met somebody who um, was the substance misuse manager in a prison. And um, another story for another time, but I, I got invited to run a pilot program. That pilot program turns out to be a 12-month pilot program, which three years on we're, we're still running. Um, and then I got into another prison and so on. So. I'm invited to, um, to come and run this pilot program. The, the guy that's br brought me in is, is a little bit skeptical because he's saying to me, well, well, how do people change? And I'm saying, I don't really know. Like, I just have a conversation with them and they change. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, OK, come and give it a go then. And, um, and, he, and he asks me, um, we'll, we'll refer some people. So they run groups in prisons, um, as you heard earlier, uh, in, in all the institutions. And so they run groups. And these groups are supposed to teach people how to change and how to be better and how to be different and, and so on. And, and to be honest with you, the guys that I work with, they're all grouped out. Um, and, he said, well, make referrals. What sort of people do you want? And I said, all of them, to send anyone. And he said, well, you know, what about people with multiple and complex needs, you know, people with addictions and mental health issues? And I said, yeah, 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 bring them. And um, he said, well, anyone? And I said, yeah, anyone. The, the, the hardest to, to reach people, give, give them to me. So, um, I'm in prison, and I don't know if, um, if you didn't put your hands up earlier when, when the question was asked, you're probably not going to know the answer to this, but you probably don't know what the inside of a prison looks like. Man, many people don't. Um, um, it's not very pleasant. Uh, the prison that I work in, is it does its best, but it's quite a smelly, noisy um, environment. Um, and people are locked up for, a, for a long periods of time in really small cells. And um, they're not usually very happy people either. So I'm a, and in prison on my first day running this pilot program for, that I've somehow managed to blag really, <laughs> and get a 12-month contract to run. And um, there'd been an incident at the weekend, and um, the men were locked up for much longer than they normally get locked up for. So they're not happy. So they were um, they're rattling the doors and putting the, the, the cuts on the, on the bars, and it was like a movie. So I'm standing there on this wing, and it's all going off, and there's shouting, and there's rattling. And I'm standing there thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> I sort of thought when I'd learned to be a life coach that I'd be in Hawaii or something. <laughs> what's, what's with this? <laughs> um, and, you know. I'm feeling intimidated and, and nervous, and I've got a great big pile of notes about what I'm going to teach because I didn't know what I was doing. And um, anyway, the men get released, and they have their breakfast, and, and they, they do their morning thing. And we have a job 
which is that we have a list and um, we're only allowed to let the people in the room that are on the list. So a man comes up to me and he's a great big burly man with tattoos and a shaven head and um, look, look quite scary to me. And, um, and he says, um, can I come in, miss? And um, I said, um, what's your name? And he said, I'm not on your list. And I, and I thought, oh, well, if he wants to come in, it's fine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Take a seat. Um, so I said, oh, well, yeah, I guess. Um, and he said, well, I just want to have a look at the chicks. I don't know if this translates in American, but chicks is slang for women in England. Yes. OK. So I thought, oh, cool, right. <laughs> so he comes, he comes into my room, moves my flip chart out of the way, and goes to the window. And on the window ledge is a nest with a bird. And the eggs haven't hatched yet. And he's out in a week. And he just wanted to see had they hatched before he gets out. I don't know what that man's name is. But he saved me. Because in that moment, I saw how much invisible thinking I had. I was there for, you know, out of choice. I chose to be there. I, I saw the, the truth and the love inside of all these people. And yet, even I had so much judgment and so much thinking going on that I was completely unaware of. So he, he looked at the nest and we talked about the, the chicks and, um, and he went. And it brought such humility to me to realise how, how much I was standing there judging people. So I always say that he saved the programme because then when the men came in, you know, I was, I was much more relaxed and much more me and um, had less on it. As I said, it's three years later now and, and Beyond Recovery has been on a, a roller coaster journey in that time and lots of things are going on. We've been nominated for awards. We've, we've, Part of this, uh, part of a big research program that we've been doing, um, uh, all sorts of, of things are going on, and um, I'm an entrepreneur apparently. <laughs> um, so, yeah, <laughs> who knew? Um, so, you know, I spend a lot of time getting new business and doing all these things and, and so on and so forth, and, and speaking at awesome events, and. Um, but I wanted to bring it back to what it's all about for me. And in the very early days, I've, I've got time for another little story. Do you want another story? In the very early days of running our program, there was a man who came and, and, and sat in our room. And um, when he was five, um, he was in naughty school, as he called it. And the teacher asked the, uh, the, the five little boys, you know, what did they want to be? And he said, I want to be a gangster. Because his dad was a gangster and his uncles were gangsters. And he spent a lot of his childhood hiding behind sofas, um, barricading their front doors, um, running drugs into prison for his uncles who were in prison. So that was the life that he, he desired and, and he thought it was fun and, and so on. And when he was 15, his dad gave him his first dose of heroin. And um, this man's 35, he's sat in our classroom. And he, he, he's another big guy, so big, big guy, um, quite scary looking, quite aggressive. Um, thought we were talking a load of CARP. Um, gets very, very cross with, with us and what we're saying to him. And all of a sudden, 
he realises, I think I'm living in my negative thinking. He just realised that. And he said, give me a book. So he takes a book and when he's allowed to leave, he, he leaves and he goes and reads The Enlightened Gardener by Sid Banks. And then he comes back the next day and he wants another book, so he reads The Missing Link by Sid Banks. Well, fast forward two years. This man, who literally for the last 20 years has been in and out of prison, when he wasn't in prison, he'd, he'd, he'd punched somebody and they died, um, his, his baby had died, his, his girlfriend had committed suicide in the bed beside him, he'd, he'd been drink driving and killed another man, and these were just the things that he admitted to. So, you know, the, there'd been a lot of trauma and a lot of stuff happened in his life. And um, fast forward to two months ago, so two years later, He's now a trained practitioner. We trained him in prison to be one of our practitioners. And he ran his own group. And there were men in that group who were popping like popcorn with insights about their own life, about their own well-being, about their own resilience. Um, we, we trained two guys, him and his friend, and um, both of them would say that they used to be, um, couldn't be trusted with a broom. And, um, and, and they became two of the highest trusted prisoners in that prison, and they've, they've actually now been released to an open prison, something that was completely impossible uh, when he was being three man, ha had a three-man escort to move him from, from visits to, back to his cell. And that insight in the park that day that lit the fire inside of me, that I followed, I didn't even know what it meant. I didn't have to work out why or how or what to do, I just followed that feeling, that insight. Has led to this guy who I completely admire and respect and look up to and go and, and talk to him. And if I'm writing a funding application or if I'm thinking about a new piece of business and how to run it, I go and talk to him and say, what do you think? And I mean, he's an amazing businessman. When I think about the impact that he can have on the world, with what he knows about the underground, and now what he knows about the, the overground is how he likes to put it. Um, I, I'm, I move beyond words to describe that, how I feel about that, that, that my vision didn't even touch that. You know, I imagined that people would feel better. I imagined that people would, um, stop taking drugs uh, and, you know, stop, stop um, smuggling in mobile phones and stop being violent. And, and they stopped all that, you know, they don't do that. Uh, but that's like, yeah, so what now, you know? It's like, that's just normal. Um, and, and, and I saw the potential and the, the wonderment and the childlikeness and the, the brilliance of, of the guys that I work with you know, I love them. Uh, they're like my children. Um, but I never knew how truly amazing they can be in the world and what they bring to the world. And that means I never knew it in me either. I never saw it in myself. I never knew I could do that. And, and a, lo a lot of times when you work with princ free principles practitioners, we talk about it's not me, but it, it is you. Yeah, it is us. We're bringing it, we're the channel, we're the ones who are bringing it and are open and want to share it. So own it. Be good with that. Um, when I spoke this year at the uh, London conference, 
I shared something that I'm going to share now with you, which is you're already it. You're already everything that you need to be. We all, we all are. The only reason that you don't know it is because it's so natural that we just don't look at it. We look for what's missing. We look for what we haven't got. We look for what we want to change. But we've all got this natural, beautiful life and fire inside of us that wants us to thrive and live and be happy. And it's already there. And, it, and you might miss it sometimes, and you might get caught up in your head sometimes, and we might have all this going on. It's, that's OK. So what? Just know that you're already it. And I love you all. Thank you for listening. OK. Golly, that's, we're on a streak of awesome now, aren't we? That's great. I love hearing stories like that. I mean, when it's just, again, it just shows like how universal it is. It doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter the, how long it's been going on. It doesn't, none of that matters. What country, it, it, it just doesn't matter. Um, I want to just close uh, uh, with a, just a, a quick point. Um, and, and to kind of send us off to rest up for tomorrow. Um, when uh, talking about that, that moment where it clicks, that moment where you get bit, you know, that defining moment, as you, I've heard George Pransky say many times. And um, when I'm going back to my story about working in group with the, with the patients, when I'd ask them about the magic, I said I would do the magic tricks and, and I would have people say, you know, I feel like I'm six years old again. And, and I would ask them, well, why do you think you feel better? And they would say, someone always would say, well, I think it's because we got a break from reality. You, you got my mind off of my problems. And so I got a, I got a break from reality. But in actual fact, they're getting in touch with reality. It's not a break from reality. Reality is now, and that's where those feelings live. So for this conference, our vision and our hope is that we can all hang out in reality with each other and be in touch with it. This is not an escape. When you guys go back to work and you're like, well, I guess it's back to reality. I got to get back to the paperwork. No, you're, you, when you start doing that, you're leaving reality. Okay? So think about that and just enjoy your time here. Take care of yourself. Just let the, let the feet, the, the, the traffic from the heart to the head is, is, is like it's free flowing, but from the head to the heart, it's backed up. You know, like, uh, you know, it's interstate traffic on Friday afternoon. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it, you'll get there eventually, but if you can get the feelings first, the, the understanding and the knowledge will follow. So just want to close off. You guys have a great night tonight. What time are we start tomorrow? So, 8 a.m. 8 a.m.? Well, breakfast is, breakfast is at 8 a.m. Okay. Great. Do I do that? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have the sure. Breakfast is at 8 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and then we start at 9. Thank you, Jamie. I feel like I've gotten so close with you. Right. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, guys. Thank you very much.